you've created great heroes, and we have. If we fought in every American war on both, in, in the Civil War on both sides, and we did, then what they said about us being lazy and shiftless and the people without a, achievement is a lie. And this lie is in so many textbooks, then they have to rewrite those textbooks in order to bring them in line with the truth. If you told the truth about Haiti, you would know that Toussaint L'Overture, Dessalines, and Christophe stood up to Napoleon and drained the French treasury so much in this attempt to take Haiti that the Louisiana territory had to be sold. And these three black men in Haiti forced the authorization of the physical territory of the United States. And to say that we have made no act as though we are people without achievement, we've not only altered the physical territory of the United States, we've altered the cultural being of the United States. We've given this nation a soul. What do you think they fear the ultimate end of African centricity would be? Once we stand up straight with our full manhood and our full womanhood, they will have to recognize this. And they will have to discard the concept of inferiority and superiority. We have a lot of, a lot of educated African Americans in this country, but still with all of this education, many would say that we don't own anything or own very little. What are the limitations of American education where the political and economic needs of black people are concerned? America does not train us to possess. America tried to train us to be worthy of becoming a part of someone else's institution as against building and controlling institutions of our own. Um, if we constitute a nation within a nation and a large nation within a nation, so does a whole lot of other ethnic groups. The Italians have a built-in national structure within the United States, and there's no conflict about it. The Jewish people have a built-in national structure in the United States, and there's no conflict about it. Why is there a conflict when we can build in a, a national structure without threatening anything that this nation promises itself or to the world. In fact, we can do this and enhance this nation by building our own institutions, by being more self-reliant, by having the funds to take care of more of our people. There'll be less of us on welfare. We could build, we could build more jobs in our own communities. We can find jobs for a whole lot of our young people who are not doing anything. If we taught our history properly, a lot of our people would love themselves to the extent that they would do more things for themselves. There's no contradiction in this and what's already being done by other people. So, what, so what's the fair? What's the, what's what's the, the deal? Fear? Uh -huh. Equality is a fear in this country. It's not a fear among other people, but it's a fear when it comes to us. Uh -huh. Because we have to get this through our skulls and get rid of our illusion. We were not brought here to be de given democracy and Christianity and, 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 and citizenship. We were brought to labor. Machines made a lot of that labor obsolete. And so you've got a large population, numerically more than the total population of Scandinavia. You got no place to send them because the African continent where they came from have not invited them to come home.
And if they invited them to come home, all of them are not going to go anyway. So we created a dilemma because when America said liberty and justice for all and drew the picture of the all, we were not in that picture. And if you get a simple thing through your skull, I think we can operate. This country was found as a haven for free white Protestant males, middle class and up, those who agree with the prevailing political status quo and who own property. Everybody else in this country is getting themselves about their citizenship. This is basically from the beginning, from the economic point of view, a New England run country. Remember, Europe dumped its human garbage can into the Western world. Some of the worst of that garbage can was dumped into the United States. Though New Englanders came escaping persecution, otherwise some of them had a little money when they got here, some of them had a little class when they got here. In other states, especially the warmer states, settled by debtors, prisoners, and people with no visible means of support. And what did some of these people become? managers of slave plantations, slave drivers. And many of them were less skillful than the slaves, because many of the slaves were better blacksmiths, better carpenters, better plasterers, better ship's caulkers. So they had, because they had to compete with these skilled slaves for jobs, they had less security than the slave who was somebody's property. His security was the fact that if he's going to function and be profitable to his master, he had to have at least a minimum of protection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Final question before we get to your two books. You have mentioned some criteria that must be met in terms of what we call ourselves. Would, would you address that, please? I'm saying that we made a mistake in the beginning when we accepted the word Negro because there's no such thing. Some lazy Spaniard or Portuguese took a descriptive adjective and made it into a noun and slapped it on a people <laughs> along with the word native. Then we begin to call ourselves colored. Colored don't mean nothing because everything is colored one way or the other. Even the absence of color is a form of color. <laughs> See, then we begin to overdo the word black. Black is an honorable word. There's nothing basically wrong with it. Black tells you how you look, but it don't tell you who you are. The proper name of a people must always relate to land, history, and culture. So the name that a people answer to must instantaneously relate to land, history, and culture. Black relates to no land, history, and culture. There's a whole lot of black people who are not Africans. Color relates to nothing in, in, especially. When you use the word German, what do you think about? Beethoven, great music, technicians, can fix anything, sauerkraut, dictators, good and bad. Some images, not, not complimentary, but images, no doubt. Mention French, good cooking, Maurice Chevalier, great lovers, fake image, Napoleon, an idiot by my definition, 
but images anyway. Mention the word Negro. So what do you think about? Depression. <laughs> See what I mean? There's nothing complimentary about it. You think of a form of depression. You think of a form of oppression. If you think of the word Africa in the honest sense, you think of one of the great adventures in human history. From that continent has come the first organized society, the world's first doctor, M. Hotel, the basis of what you think of as Greek philosophy. The early book of the, what they later called the Book of the Dead, the lit, now valid literature that went into the making of the Bible. Great empires before and after, they existed before and after slavery. States in Africa run by a single African ruler, larger than the United States. Great African sailors who sailed throughout the world and settled in Europe and in parts of the Americas. When you look at Africa in its true sense, it related to the whole world. And the African had a curiosity in history that made him go out and look for other people. And he achieved something that hasn't been achieved by other people. He amalgamed his culture with uh, those of other people's culture, created still another culture without destroying either one of the cultures that met. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I met, talked to someone yesterday, I'm not gonna say where, but this individual, a young lady told me, she said, I ain't no African, I'm an American. I don't even like African. How do you, how do you deal with that kind of mentality? First place I reached for my handkerchief. <laughs> mm. That's a sad and sick human being. An Italian would never say, I'm not an Italian. Although he's been here five generations, he would never say that. Mm -hmm. A Jewish person would never stop claiming Palestine, though his claim to Palestine is open to question, but he ain't gonna stop claiming it. The German will never stop claiming German, though he's been here five generations. Mm -hmm. You're an African person, wherever you are on the face of this earth, you walk this earth as an African person. You are not less an American because you're an African person born on American soil and raised under American conditions. One of your books is entitled Notes for an African World Revolution. Africans at the Crossroads. Why did you feel called to write a book of this nature? I felt called on to address myself to the possibilities that the African is capable of dynamic social change. And that uh, once he's exposed to the information of dynamic social change and to the personalities in Africa that brought about dynamic social change, he might bring it about again at this critical time in, in, in history. I consider it my best political book and might be the best book I've written so far. In chapter one, you emphasize the 19th century origins of the African and African-American uh, freedom struggle. Why do you think this emphasis is important? Because in this freedom struggle of African people, that 19th century in Africa, in the Caribbean islands, and in the United States, may well have been one of the greatest centuries of our history as a people. We were coming out of slavery, and slavery in, in uh, chattel slavery was turning into colonialism. We were meeting challenges. We were building new institutions. In the first half of the 19th century, we were making contact with Africa, the African Colonization Society. Liberia as a nation was being built. The Caribbean islands were coming out of a great period of of successful slave revolts, some of the most successful in history. 
For 100 years, the Africans' anti-colonial wars were successful, and they out some of the finest military minds of Europe. And most of these Africans, called chiefs, uh, had never heard of a military school or wore a stowball shoe, yet they took a spear and a shield and faced down some of the finest armies of Europe for personal courage and for letting our enemies know what we were entitled to all over the world. This was our finest century. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What did we fail to learn from the 19th century freedom struggle that would have helped us in the 20th century? That you don't beg for what belongs to you. You insist and you demand. I thought we, in the 20th century, demonstrated too much and planned too little. We shouted nation time when we did not understand what goes into the making of a nation. Before we shouted nation time, we should have taken an inventory of what goes into the making of a nation. If you're gonna make a nation, you need mining engineers, you need airport designers, you need chemists, you need oceanographers, you need ship builders, you need those who ship captains, you need all of these things. You should systematically plan these things and send your students to the schools where they can learn these things. And we should have less demonstrations, but more progress in preparation. We could have learned a great deal from the rise of modern Japan, from an agrarian nation to one of the finest industrial nations of the world. We talked too much, we shouted too much, we demonstrated too much. In the meantime, we gave up a, a lot of good energy that we could have used in the preparation for nationness. We give out enough energy on the dance floor to build 10 cities. Hmm. We, I thought we directed our energy the wrong way and... Do you think we spent too much time trying to get into somebody else's thing as opposed we to... We spent too much time trying, trying to, to get into somebody else's thing instead of building our own thing and we did not notice that a lot of the nation building entities in our own community was deteriorating before so-called integration, there was good black tailors in nearly every black community. There was uh, six or seven black grocery stores, about every other corner, a little black grocery store. There was small black hotels, clean as a whistle, and the lady that ran the hotel can put a dish before you will make other people apologize for cooking. <laughs> <laughs> or come integration when you can go in the other hotel you've been the neglected the whole thing. now you now come integration you should put some money into that small hotel make it a big hotel and continue to go there she needed the money the community mm -hmm. still needed the money we start going to other a lot of our institute a lot of our predominantly black colleges began to uh, decline because of, oh we just, we just got to be be with the others. Mm -hmm. The NACP syndrome set in, and that is uh, you soak in education by osmosis. You just got to get close to somebody else, and you're going to get a better education just by being there, which is a lie. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think we, are, we have become too proud of being able to go to that hotel? I, I, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, that's because we've the, built no hotels of mm -hmm. our own. Now, I... Um, I think we, we could have been building some things of self-reliance, basically the thing, because I said uh, a few weeks ago that I'm tired of speeches and that Farrakhan would impress me more if he built a shoelace factory, mm -hmm. the building all the shoes. And four years ago, I challenged a group of, at a family meeting in Louisville, Kentucky, I said, why don't we just make our, let's just start making our underwear. One of the things about underwear is that nobody's looking at it except your 
private person. And so if you don't get it right at first, you have a little time to get it straight. Mm -hmm. But if you spend... And, but, but there is now a black-run underwear factory in Louisville, Kentucky, where I made the speech, mm -hmm. called Kimware. Mm -hmm. um, isn't that better than making speeches? Go ahead and do. I hope the suits will come next, and the, you know. So let's let's the, let's find jobs for our young people. Let's teach them to love each other and stop killing each other. Mm -hmm. But uh, but until we feel a sense of shame about always buying from other people, will we ever do any um, any building? We've got to feel a sense of shame for always buying from other people instead of organizing our own. Then we've got to feel a sense of pride in getting from our own. Then our own has to, has to have a sense of pride in serving us well. And our own is also expected to give us bargains just like everybody else, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at least once in a while. In, in Notes for an African Revolution, you, wrote, you write about... Booker T. Washington and uh, W. B. Du Bois. Why? Why did you deal with them? I deal with them because uh, the Booker T. Washington and W. E. B. Du Bois' lack of, I uh, mean, uh, disagreement over educational procedure is still with us. Being with us, mm -hmm. uh, but it's but it's called a controversy. It wasn't a controversy. It was just a disagreement over procedure. And these two men did not dislike each other. These two men just happened to have a disagreement. Du Bois was supposed to go to Tuskegee to teach, but the letter from Wilberforce arrived earlier, so he accepted the letter from, from, from Wilberforce. Wilberforce only gave him $900 a year. Booker D. Washington was going to give him $950 a year. Can you imagine somebody working for nine, less money than you make a week? <laughs> Mm -hmm. But Du Bois was, had intellectual uh, disagreements with a whole lot of people, and besides Du Bois, probably I, I consider him one of the great intellects we produced in America, and I'm willing to acknowledge he was a snob. But that don't take nothing from the fact that as a rounded intellect, he's the finest intellect we produced outside of Africa. The seed of the civil rights movement had its birth in the 19th and 20th century. What do you think are the major successes of the civil rights movement and the failures? Well, the major successes of the civil rights movement was to really call attention to our plight in America, national and international, and to inform other African people throughout the world about our plight. The major failures of the civil rights movement was not to understand it politically and to do so much shouting, very little astute planning was done. Very little astute uh, follow-up. Uh, maybe three years ago, I had asked someone who's going to do a television thing on it, what happened to the nine kids in the, the Little Rock controversy? Mm -hmm. They all alive. They were all alive, and one named Green was then assistant secretary of, uh, of labor. Wouldn't it be interesting to find out what what happened to them over the years, and where are they now? They never thought about it. <laughs> A lot of things we need to think about. We need to a reassessment of of Dr. King beyond the the dream speech, because the dreams Dr. King's dream speech was the least significant of all the speeches he ever made. I'm sorry he made it. Well, why you say that? Because we get so hung up with his dream, we don't pay attention to his plan. He had a dream in one speech, but he had a plan in a whole lot of other speeches. 
And we seem to have forgotten that. What, what were those plans like? And, uh, the plan was to restore the soul, the spiritual soul of this nation. I think we expected too much of Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King was a great theologian, a great spiritual leader. He wasn't an Africanist, and he had no great knowledge of Africa. He had no great knowledge of Mahatma Gandhi. Otherwise, nobody would have followed Mahatma Gandhi who had knowledge of him. Mahatma Gandhi was an East Indian nationalist and a racist who did not do very much for the Africans when he was in South Africa. And who resented being in the same train car uh, with the Africans. He was an East Indian nationalist. He didn't have much to say about the Chinese and, uh, and, and the misery they were suffering under under the Japanese at the time. I'm not against Ma, uh, Mahatma Gandhi because he was an East Indian nationalist. He was also uh, a, 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 a B actor and a, in part a faker, but he got the job done. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kojo Namdi, host of Evening Exchange, and this is the historic Lincoln Theater, a beautiful theater awaiting an audience, just like the Evening Exchange weekly news analysis, and we are hoping that you will be our audience every Friday at 7.30 as some of the most influential journalists in Washington gather to analyze the cataclysmic events of our times. That's every Friday at 7.30 on your Channel 32. Looking for a graduate school? Think Howard University. Choose from 23 PhD and 32 master degree programs. Choose Howard and join the tradition of excellence, a level one research university with the most distinguished and diversified faculty scholars in the nation. Become a part of the Howard Graduate School tradition today. Howard University, preparing tomorrow's leaders today. Zero nine. Good evening and welcome to For the People and part three of Listerveld Middleton's conversation with noted historian Dr. John Henry Clark. I'm Bill Terrell, executive producer of the program, substituting for Listerveld Middleton. As some of you know, and perhaps most of you are finding out for the first time, Listerveld Middleton was diagnosed with bone marrow cancer in February of 92. Listerveld has just finished his latest round of treatment and is progressing well. We'd like to thank you and we appreciate your continued support. And now part three begins as Listerveld asked Dr. Clark this question. In your book, Notes for an African World Revolution, you have a section there entitled Five Africans and Their Uncompleted Revolutions. What is the significance of the emphasis on these five personalities? The emphasis on Kwame Nkrumah, Mboye, Lumumba in Africa, Malcolm X and Marcus Garvey in the United States is that if people plan and risk their lives in revolutionary activity for us, we have to give them the protection to live long enough to let us know what their plans are. And sometimes they are cut down before our eyes without protection 
from us. And 20 years after they are dead, we wonder what would have happened to us had they lived when we had the power to keep them living had we exercised it. And the, the, the significance is that in the direction that all of these men were going was toward nation building, nation structure. In many ways, they were following Booker T. Washington's lead of self-reliance. And if you study uh, Malcolm in the U.S., you find out that Malcolm was following Elijah's lead, and Elijah came out of the Garvey movement. Tom and Boye was searching for a nation in Kenya that would look after all the fragments in Kenya as against being dominated by one tribe. Lumumba wanted a unified Congo, and that would have, a unified Congo would have given the Congo, there were two nations in Africa, the Congo and um, Nigeria, it could have been two of the richest nations in Africa had it um, developed. And had Marcus Garvey succeeded, his, um, the independent explosion in Africa would have happened 50 years uh, uh, before. I'm saying that we will never know where these men would have gone because they were cut down while they were still growing. Mm -hmm. And we need to produce the atmosphere that will let people grow to their fullness. I think Martin Luther King should have grown to his fullness. And had Martin Luther King grown to his fullness, I'm not saying Martin Luther King would have joined Malcolm X. I'm saying that Martin Luther King and Malcolm X would have understood that they differed only and they were both by growing. methodology. Mm -hmm. And they were both growing. They, they were both growing. Mm -hmm. And neither one of us know how far they would have grown had they lived long enough to grow. Mm -hmm. And they were both cut down right in front of our eyes. And we still have not thoroughly investigated the circumstances of their death. Mm -hmm. You say slave revolts in the Caribbean and South America were more successful than the ones in the United States. Yes. Why? Because in the Caribbean and South America, the slave masters bought, bought in large lots and kept the lots together. Therefore, the Africans maintain a cultural continuity. And though that all the slaves on one plantation generally came from one general area in Africa, so they spoke the same basic language, had the same basic drum language, the same basic culture. In the United States, they bought like a brokerage. They would buy, might buy 10 early in the week. And by the end of the week, they might have sold eight of that 10. So mother goes one way, father goes another way. And so the, the different culture groups get mixed up to the point where it's hard to maintain a loyalty system. And why in the Caribbean and in South America, you could maintain a loyalty system. Therefore, most of the slave revolts in the Caribbean islands in South America were planned by house servants. While in the United States, most of the slave revolts were betrayed by house servants. Mm -hmm. What is the significance of this today for us? The significance of this today is that irrespective of positions, basically, most African people in the United States are black people have to share the same condition. At Kennedy Airport in New York City, where it's very difficult for a black person to get a cab day or night, almost impossible certain times of the night, John Johnson of Johnson Publishing Company 
who at the last count was worth over $200 million. He couldn't get a cab any faster than I could. Mm -hmm. He's taller and about the same coloration of black. And maybe I could get a cab better than he because, because of his size, the cab driver might fear him a little more than me. I mean, his status as one of the richest black people in America doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean a single thing when he's just trying to get a cab and he got enough money to buy three cab companies. <laughs> now, whereas, I'm trying to get, trying to get to the point that you're making. Um, I'm making the point that black people who think they're so different from other black people got illusions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they better get rid of them. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm because of our enemies. No, I thought you were going to draw a contrast between um, the condition of blacks in this country and the condition of blacks in the Caribbean. Well, South the condition America. of the blacks in the, in the Caribbean, because see, in, in the middle of the 19th century, the blacks in the Caribbean began to lose the effects of culture continuity. And because of the diabolical skillfulness of the British and other colonialists, they began to break themselves down into color gradations and to the point where you had brown skinned communities and black skinned communities and, and almost white communities. While in the United States, this did not, this did not happen. Okay. I mean, okay. so they're in about right now, they're in some time of as bad a condition as the rest of us, if not worse in some cases. Mm -hmm. In your book, Notes for an African World Revolution, you have a title, a, a chapter entitled, Africa, Zionism, and Friends Without Friendship. What was your intent in choosing this title? My intent in choosing the title is that a lot of people come to us as friends because we accept people without question more than other people. And these friends sometimes serve us as long as it is to their convenience. And when it is no longer to their convenience, they go their way. And when they have to join our opposition, it presents no problem to us, though they were parading as our friends yesterday and getting radical reputation saying that they were in the march on Washington. Friendship is something that lasts. Mm -hmm. Being without friendship is some temporary thing that comes and goes depending on your mood and your convenience. And I'm saying that they have reached the point of self-interest and enlightenment that we have not reached. Mm -hmm. And that is self-interest first. So, so what do you think of the much talked about relationship between African Americans and Jews? What do you? I think it has been good and bad depending on the circumstances. But any time a relationship with us causes difficulty between them and the other parts of white America, then the relationship with us is sacrificed. Mm -hmm. That they will have good relationship to us so long as it don't cause them any difficulty with the rest of white America. You asked the question in this book, can African people save themselves? Can we? I think we can. Mm -hmm. Before people can save themselves, they must first believe in themselves. They have to save themselves from misconceptions about themselves. And they must save themselves from negative action that they are responsible for that um, hurt themselves. They must treasure themselves and preserve themselves and, and their own children. 
we have to come closer to each other and talk to each other. We must give up some individuality for collective action. Mm -hmm. One of your book is entitled Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust. Why that title? The title Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust is because the Christopher Columbus era set in motion the protracted murder of Africans that makes the African, the murder of the Africans far in excess of the murder of Jews in Germany or in Europe called the Holocaust. I also remind the reader that the affair in Europe was a, a difference between European and European that it should have been solved by Europeans in as much as it was started by Europeans. I'm saying that Europeans are uncanny geniuses at draining the diseased pulse of their political sores on the lands of other people. No Africans or Arabs had anything to do with this catastrophe in Europe. European racism had spent itself out, outside of Europe, in the oppression of India, Africa, and islands in the sea. In Europe, it turned inward on itself. Therefore, what we call the Holocaust. I'm saying that while this was a European thing, we should have understanding and sympathy for its victims and for its survivors. I will not debate whether it was six million or five million, I don't know and have not taken the time out to try to know statistically how many people were killed. If it was only six, it was wrong. And on the basis of human life and humanity in the fact that I must lift my voice when any human being is being killed unjustly to protect myself from being killed unjustly. I have no problems in condemning the event, but I know that it was small numerically in comparison to what happened in Africa and to what happened in Asia, the Belgium's misadventure in the Congo, comparison to what happened in the Pacific, in comparison to what happened in off the coast of Australia, an island called Tasmania, where the British killed every man, woman, and child, not a single Tasmanian alive, not even a relative of, of a Tasmanian, no place on the face of the earth. And while I applaud the fact that skillful propaganda and documentation have given us the illusion that this was the greatest mass murder in history, it was far from being mm -hmm. that. It was small in comparison to other holocausts. And when these other holocausts were happening, other parts of the world, most of Europe, most of European people, including those who would eventually become victims of the European Holocaust, were silent and non-committal about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do you think the, the, these other uh, atrocities did not get the label Holocaust? 
mainly because no one had invented the label mm -hmm. and the idea in Europe was that these other people being killed were savages and that killing them, invading their country was an act of civilizing which indeed it was not. I want to get back, take you back to Christopher Columbus and ask you to specifically lay out the role he played in, in I guess, setting the slave trade in motion. Christopher Columbus is a mystery in history and Michael Bradley's book, The, the Columbus Conspiracy, he implied that there could be two Christopher Columbuses. He found so much dirt under that name and so many illegitimate children and women with children he deserted. He didn't believe that any one man was capable mm -hmm. of all of this. Mm -hmm. Christopher Columbus obviously attended the school of navigation and map making and ship chartering in Portugal found by Prince Henry the, the nav called, called the navigator, though there's no proof that he ever went to sea. There is in his diary an entry that says, as man and boy, I sailed up and down the Guinea coast for 23 years. The Guinea coast is upper West Africa. Mm -hmm. What was he doing up and down the Guinea coast for 23 years? Look at, look at eight, uh, 1492 and subtract 23 years. That means he could have been part of the early Portuguese slave trade. There is a book on Jamaica that opens with Christopher Columbus visiting um, the court of Isabella and Ferdinand in Spain. In that book, they refer to him as a Jewish adventurer. I didn't write the book, and the reference is not mine. There are other books that re refer to Christopher Columbus in, in such a way. I personally don't care about his descent, or rather deal with what he opened up because he opened up the Western Hemisphere for European exploitation without discovering anything. He said he opened it up for Western exploitation. Without discovering anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because it was already peopled. But what specifically did he do to, to get the slave thing going? He called attention to the richness in those Indies, and his sailors killed so many people in the West Indies that he went to Father de las Casas, who came over on his third voyage, and asked him to petition the Pope for increase in the slave trade, the, the African slave trade, to save the soul of the Indians. The Pope sent commissions to some of the islands to, to look in the affairs of the Indians and on many of the islands there wasn't a single Indian alive. This increase in the African sla slave trade allegedly to save the soul of the Indians led to an accentuation of the African slave trade and to put it into second gear. Mm -hmm. And so the peopling of the Caribbean islands by Africans in the starting of the plantation system in the Caribbean islands and in Brazil and parts of South America is Christopher Columbus's contribution to the starting and the widespread use of slaves in the development of the plantation system. 
Mm -hmm. In the New World. And all of this is described by Father D. Les Casas in a classic little work not read so much these days, The Devastation of the Indies. Father D. Les Casas is called the first historian of the New World. And this book was so indicting not only on the earliest settlers, but on the role of the church in the slave trade that the Pope had the book brought to, Spain, brought to Rome. It was locked up and for 200 years, nobody was permitted to read it. Mm -hmm. And you can read it in any good library now. It's called The Devastation of the Indies. The writer's father, Bartholomew D. Las Casas. He also wrote a book called The Tears of the Indians. I'm in the process of combining the first book and the second book together with a new introduction and, and a new bibliography in order to bring them out again. But if anybody wants to read those books right now, you go to a good, competent library. I don't know where you'd find the book called The Tears of the Indians, because I only have a Xerox copy. In fact, I only have a Xerox mm -hmm. copy of Devastation of the Indies. <laughs> I know John Hopkins published it a few years ago, and they may still have it. Now, where, the, where did I hear that, and this may not be true, that Christopher Columbus had Native Americans to go out and look for gold, and, and when they didn't find enough gold, he would have their arms chopped off or hands chopped off. Is that true? This or is, is that well documented. It's, it's, it's documented in Father D. Les Casas' work. It's documented in other works. It's also documented in Eric Williams' work, Documents on West Indian History, and in another work, the, one of the last major works by Eric Williams, called Christopher Columbus, called The Caribbeans from Christopher Columbus to Castro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The book is a paperback, so it should be. So why is it that a, 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 a supposedly Christian country as America uh, supposedly is, um, why is it that, how is it that Christopher Columbus ever got to be a, a, a hero? He got to be in a view Western, of these atrocities. He got to be a Western hero because he opened up two continents for Western exploitation. And now you should really read a book called The Conquest of Mexico and Peru by Prescott. This tells you more about what they did on the land. Now Christopher Columbus, to the best I can learn from the documents, never set foot on South America or North America, but some islands in the Caribbean Sea so the, to, to say that he discovered America is, is an exaggeration. But after Christopher Columbus, other adventures began to come. Cabot from England and, and Pezzano from uh, Italy. Until then the Dutch, then there were claims and counterclaims until the Americans were colonized. And according to Father de Las Casas, in the West Indies alone, from 12 to 25 million people were killed.
I try to be honest with myself. And I always look back and re-evaluate my evaluation to the point of correcting myself if I am wrong. I had a great grandmother who I still think is a saint, or even God in disguise. I loved her that, that much. And when I couldn't find the image of my own people in the literature of the Bible, I suspected that someone had tampered with God's book, and she told me God was love, and God was merciful, God was kind, God was no respect of kith and kin. Then when I asked for a book from someone I was working for, and the role of African people in ancient history, the person told me I came from a people that have no history. And I began to search. I came to New York in the 30s, 1933, and heart of the Depression. And radicalism was norm. You didn't get investigated because you were hungry and deprived and living on a minimum level. You were expected to be radical, and most of us were. You were expected to protest. You were expected to get out in the street and hold up things. And I don't mean banks, but you expect to be. Get on streetcars and dare the, without paying, and dare the conductor to put you off. And you expect it to block people's way, going into stores where you couldn't get a job. And we did all those things. And we had a very healthy attitude toward doing them. And, uh, the so-called buy, buy black campaign that started in Chicago has spread to uh, New York and we were fighting for jobs in our own community. A multiplicity of political wings fighting for our attention, communists, socialists, and Trotskyites, and radical groups of all kinds and different branches of religions also fighting for our, uh, our attention. And, uh, but we, were, we thought we were trying to make a new world and come 1935, 1936 in the Italian-Ethiopian War, we refocused a lot of our attention on Africa again and, and to some extent gave a, a rebirth, a revitalization to the concept of back to Africa. Situations like Rodney King in Los Angeles keep up, we, we, we don't realize we ain't got nobody to turn to but each other. Mm -hmm. That we were not brought to America to be given democracy or citizenship. And that's America's dilemma and our dilemma also. Let's deal with the images of today, and let's deal with the, the, the John Wayne image, the image of the Caucasian always being the hero, and the image of the black always being the, the loser. Let's deal with the I Spy image, uh, the old series that uh, uh, Bill Cosby appeared in years ago. The, white protagonist nearly always got the girl and on occasion when Bill Cosby encountered a black girl he couldn't even win her old. and this white guy was just knocking over blonde brunettes and everybody else all over the place you know so we, you, know, you got the image of somebody else as the great lover and the great something another the image of the black man as being a Inadequate, not only inadequate lover, but even inadequate even in talking to a woman. And we know full well this is not true.
This is the best information age ever known to man. And there is no excuse for so many people being so terribly misinformed. There's no excuse for people having debates, even almost fistfights over something you can verify by opening the page of a book. What we fail to take into consideration is that when Europe needed a rationale for slavery, they not only colonized most of the world, they colonized information about the world, they colonized um, image. And the most disastrous of all the images for us, they colonized the image of God. People, as a rule, looks at God as a figure that resembles themselves. This is universally true until it comes to us. When we gave up our original concept of God, we were in trouble. We're not talking about God. We're talking about concept now. We're not talking about whether we're Christian or not. We're talking about if we are Christian, we should have a concept of Christianity that's distinctly ours. And we did not look at other ethnic groups, principally Jewish. Jewish people hadn't had, had dismantled a single institution, and they're integrated. Irish haven't dismantled a single institution, and they're integrated. We could, we could have sharpened our institution other than to dismantle them and pull away from them. The minute the white schools or colleges were open to us, we began to neglect the predominant the black schools, which was the worst thing we could have done. We could have strengthened them. And we still think that every student who wants to go to one of the predominant white schools, and if they have courses that you need, and you should be able to go there. But we still think that the predominant black schools should remain as the institution where you are more readily accepted and the school that has graduated the largest number of blacks and the schools that still graduate the largest number of blacks the schools where they do not in mass drop out and many of the white schools put certain pressure on them that many of them don't finish the second year most of them who go to the predominantly black schools generally finish. We must deal with a school system where so many children go into school and they are programmed into a depressive attitude about themselves because uh, they're told through emphasis and through direct image they're not a part of the total society. And when they go leave the school, many times they go out to try to establish a kind of human beingness, and seeking a kind of ego massage that they could not find in the school. And therefore the gangs and the speech and part of it is in the rap and all of this is, is a search for a form of identity that the society had denied, has denied them. I do not think that rap needs to be vulgar. I do not think that rap needs to be a series of silly grunts. I think if the rappers did a little more reading and thinking, so many things on that record that is factually wrong could be made right and they could make positive statements and still sell records and, and make money and one of the main reasons they have not made positive statements in most cases is that they don't know I think there's a rapper called Sister Soldier Lisa Williamson was the original name and a rap graphic called At War, 
I think this is the first rap record that I know of made a very positively profound statement and that dealt to a great degree with prophecy based on previous historical experience. And this is a step forward. If we included the history of African people into a history that is basically incorrect, that's like pouring clean water into a dirty glass. I think there need to be a corrected general history of the United States and our history, our corrected history, need to be part of that correction. And I think that we need a, curri a, a curricula of correction, a curricula of liberation, a curricula of truth. And when we talk about inclusion, we should be included into something that at least part of purified. I think people should stop looking for individual leaders charismatic leader might be a thing of the past. Let's look for a charismatic program. And if the leader dies, and you're on page 13, turn to page 14. Bear the man, continue the plan. I think we have more leaders and less leadership than any people in this country, or in the world for that matter. I can remember a time, I'm just that old, when you could get a fight for saying a bad word in front of a man's sister. Walking past a man's grandmother without saying, excuse me. We had some manners that we brought over, some courtesies we used to maintain among ourselves. They kept us together and kept us respectful one to the other that we seem to have discarded. It used to be unthinkable for a girl to even marry or even consider marrying any man unless she showed him off in her community. We want to know what everybody in the community think about him. If they didn't think well of him, she's going to think twice as to whether she want to marry him. This kind of Seeking community census and consent is no longer there we, in an individual move as against a collective approach to things. We need to get the collective back again and come closer together in some kind of common interest. And I think Pan-Africanism and African nationalism coming together in a collective way and transcending all borders, religions, and politics is the only salvation for the whole of the African world. And yet, instead of moving toward that sense essential ideology that could have saved us, we retreated from it at the most critical time in our history when our enemies understood that if they could fragment us based on Africa, Caribbeans, and Black America, that they can extend their longevity as the dominant force in the world, economically especially, much longer. And that with all of our collection of intellects and thinkers and book writers, very few of them saw that. 
The Caribbeans were in a Caribbean bag, the Africans were in an African bag, the Black Americans were in a Black American bag. When all of that enemies were the same, and all of them needed to be a one political and cultural and economic bag. If your oppressor uses the word in reference to you and connects you with nation, he gives you respect. And to deprive you of that respect, he uses the word that has nothing to do with nation. The word Negro has nothing to do with nation. The word native has nothing to do with nation. And he will not call, most of the time, we won't call a Nigerian a Nigerian. I mean, this broadside looking at African people. But when we began our institutions in the United States, uh, our first church was the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Our first uh, large is, had Africa named the uh, 12 African gentlemen, the first comedians called the Ethiopian clowns or the, or the Nubian rascals. So we weren't afraid of the word Africa. See, then with the colonization society, we began to make a distinction between Africans who lived in Africa and Africans who lived in the United States. And therefore, near the end of the century, we started using the word color. And, uh, but what we forget is that the name of a people, any people, must relate to land, history, and culture. And any time you address any people on the face of the earth by their proper name, if that name fails to relate to land, history, and culture, you have called them out of their name. Richard Moore in his work called The Name Negro, Its Origin and Evil Use has said, slaves and dogs are named by their masters. Free men name themselves. It used to be a people in Asia called Siamese. They decided they wasn't Siamese, they were Thai-speaking people, and their country was called Thai, which should be called Thailand. And they sent a message to the post offices of the world, the nations of the world, that if you address in a mail to this country with the word Siam, Siam on it, we will throw it into the sea. And if you come here, and address any of our citizens as Siamese, we will put you in jail for defamation of character. That was the end of Siam. <laughs> and we have to take the same kind of drastic action if we're going to make change. We have to make some symbolic changes too in order to create a whole new economy. And the head of an African state should pray to an African god in public, unashamedly and unapologetically, that you reconsider that every people have a right to choose gods that look like them instead of gods that are assigned um, to them. Almost also you should have a head of state say that I will not ride in a Mercedes Benz until my people make a Mercedes Benz. I'll, I'll eat only the clothes, I wear only the clothes my people make, I'll eat only the food my people grow. You could revolutionize the economy. We are a nation within a nation. We must take on the characteristics of a nation and be self-serving. That don't mean we have detached, detached ourselves from the rest of the nation. The Italians in America function as a nation. The Jews in America function as a nation. 
yet they do not function less as a part of the United States because they also function as a nation. No single career opens a grocery store. He joins a Korean Grocerman's Association and the association sustains him and protects him. It's not an individual store opened by an individual while it is a store opened by an individual family. He's got a protection of 10 or 20 other families or stores. Therefore, he can buy in mass. Therefore, he can get insurance in mass. We can do the same thing and do it even better. Because we have some access to certain things that he hasn't got. We've been here longer. We just have to make the best use of them. I think what we have in the Koreans and a whole lot of the Asians, and unfortunately, Sometimes Caribbean people, the new buffers. This nation looks for a buffer to stop the wave of anger of the American black. There was a time in New York City when the Irish were less favored than the blacks. And for a brief period, we became a kind of a buffer then the Irish <laughs> got accepted <clears throat> in the white club, created a sloppy political machine called Tammany Hall. And the pressure they were putting on us, no longer Africa, I mean, we were small stuff and they had to be banging on us. I mean, now they could petty gangsterism control the union, certain unions. The subway union used to be basically Irish control. The police used to be basically Irish control. But all these things, and Tammany Hall, giving them a large amount of political control, they could remove themselves from the lowly status. This is dangerous and delicate. The Jewish people we're talking about, let's get this established first. We're talking about a bunch of Europeans of the Hebrew faith. We're not talking about the descendants of Jacob and Isaiah and Abraham. We're not talking about the people of the book, black people who don't know how to read the Bible or history, unfortunately. I think they're talking about the same people these are King Solomon's people. The European Jews had nothing to do with King Solomon and all the people, the biblical people. Those are, that's a separate and distinct people. We're talking about a bunch of Europeans of the Hebrew faith who were discriminated against in Europe. The Europeans drove them out of certain professions and they had to take up certain professions that the Europeans frowned on money handling, money lending, fabric handling. They become so good at these professions, the same Europeans who discriminated against them for being in the profession had to come to them. And they are good at something. Sometimes not because they're Jews, but because They've been in it longer. A bank is a listening post and a great one. When you have to make a person, the fact that it goes in a man's clothes, you can learn something about the character of the man who can wear the clothes. So they become good in the mind sciences, the, 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 the ologies. We have to start producing things, and we should start, as I've often said, with, with our basic underwear and work on up. So I wear no clothes, and my people don't produce. And we can 
employ one third of our people at once, furnishing goods and services to each other. I don't believe in fraternities and sororities in the general sense because the Greeks had no fraternities and sororities until they came in touch with African secret societies. And in as much as what you think is a Greek fraternity is based on African secret societies, why take the Greek carbon copy? Let's go back to the African original. Keep the fraternity, but go back. Take the concept back to the African original when these societies were committed. There were societies of Masons who trained other Masons and maybe the beginning of the father-son unit union, and society of stonecutters, society of craftsmen, and these men would pass on the secret of that craft to selected other members of the craft in order to preserve it. And in this way, you had the craftsmanship to maintain a nation. I think the African basis of fraternities and sororities laid the basis for the culture of independent African states long before the first European wore a shoe or lived in a house that had a window. And we need to look back in order to look forward. This is, this is the best possible time for African people because they're detractors and enemies are having problems within themselves. And this is the time for African people to solve the internal squabbles and stop breaking ourselves up into little groups based on where the slave ship took, put us down instead of where the slave ship took us from. This is a time for the whole African world to come together and begin to support itself and we need to take Pan-Africanism beyond its narrow base and to a concept of an African world union. And I think that into this should go our religions, our social organizations, and our educational institutions. And this concept should stretch across all these various religious, political, and cultural, and geographic lines. And we need to be uh, more for something than against something. And if they're going to be a people of tomorrow, then we have to be confident enough today to realize that if we're not a major part of it, then that tomorrow that we're referring to is not going to be.